what's it all about? I think we all want to know that. What's it all about? Why is it so important to know what's it all about? Because without knowing what's it all about, how do you know if what you're doing is adding to your progress or adding to the progress of the world? Or maybe what you're doing is causing regression and maybe even not building, but, but destroying. How, how do you know what you're doing if you don't know what it's about? I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a primitive and you show up in this civilized place and you, uh, you have laundry. So you ask your friend, where's the, the nearest river? He said, well, here we don't, we don't need a river. We actually have something called a washing machine. And uh, you just, you know, he said, well, what's that? He said, well, it's like, you know, you put, your, you, you, you put your, your clothing in it. There's like a door, you close it, and it's in, the, it's in the back. So, okay, you go in the back of the house, and you see this big machine. So, pretty good. And, wow, it seems much bigger than I need for my clothing. Uh, you see a door. Okay, so you throw your laundry in, inside the machine. And, uh, and there is a wheel in there. And you're trying to figure out where's the water. And so you see a hose. So... Uh, you stick the hose into the window and you start filling it up and then your friend comes running in and says, what are you doing? That's a car. And you're destroying the car. Uh, how do, if you don't know what the machinery of life is, how do you know if what you're doing is helping or hurting? That, we need to know what's it all about. The purpose of life in general. But we also want to know what's your purpose in life specifically. Because without that, how can you even be happy? How can you feel joy? I know I feel joy when I'm doing my thing, when I'm, you know, I'm feeling joy right now because my thing is to teach and share and hopefully inspire. And so what gives us a sense of happiness is knowing our purpose. It gives us a deep sense of joy when we're living our meaning. And so like, imagine you're a light bulb. You're a self-aware light bulb. You know, imagine it's a little crazy metaphor. And uh, you're trying to figure out, you just don't feel happy. You just don't feel energized. You're trying to figure it out now. You know, you, you figure, well, maybe if I just do what I do well. Well, one of the things that really do good is I put out heat. I'm really good at warming things up. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's what I should do. Uh, maybe I should go into uh, heating up rooms. Well, no, you know, uh, but, you know, there's something else I do pretty good. I, uh, I emanate light, I emit light. I, I'm pretty a shiny kind of a guy. Maybe that's what I should do. So, you know, imagine a, a light bulb that pursues a career and thinks its purpose is to bring heat into the room. It's not gonna feel happy. It's not gonna feel joy. It's not gonna feel energized. It's gonna go home at the, late at night and go into the refrigerator and start looking for food and not find anything because it's empty inside because it's about light. So why is it so essential to know the purpose of life? And why is it so essential to know your purpose in life? Because how do you know if what you're doing is actually building or breaking? And how will you find a way to really feel joy in your life, feel maximized, feel energized, feel actualized? That's what we're going to talk about is the big why. we ask the big why question, we need to define what does why mean? Uh, do, we, do we mean uh, for what motive or for what reason or do we, do we mean for what purpose? When we talk about the creator, why did the creator create the world? Are we talking about a motive, a, a reason or, or a purpose? Very, very different, very, very different. For instance, let's talk about Carl Benz. Who's Carl Benz? Carl Benz invented the first gasoline-powered automobile. Now, when we ask the question, why did Carl invent the car? I wonder if they called it a car because of him, but why did Carl invent the car? And uh, well, when you ask that question, why, did you mean, is, is that the motive? Because the motive, uh, well, first of all, we don't know, but he, he, he probably had a motive. It, could be he needed money, and that's a motive. Uh, could be he was dating somebody and was looking to impress his date by showing up in a car. Uh, could be he has a mother that's driving him crazy and he needed to get a way to get away from her. That's his motive. We don't know his motive. Uh, maybe somebody does, but, but there was a motive. But the purpose of the car, we know. We look at the car and we know its purpose is to serve 
transportation, to provide transportation. That's the purpose of the car. Now, when we talk about the creator in the world, and we ask the big why, why did the creator create this world, uh, then uh, we're not talking about motive at all. It's not that we don't know the motive like in the case of Carl Benz. It's there was no motive because a motive means that something's driving you. There's a cause that's causing you. There's a lack that you're feeling that you're trying to fulfill. And that's nonsensical when we talk about the prime mover. The prime mover is not driven. The prime mover is not caused. There's nothing moving God. There's no motivation. So, so when we talk about why God created the world, the answer is what we say in Hebrew, kacha. He just wanted to. He just wanted to, just for the what we call the love of it. He just wanted to. There was no lack that the Creator was feeling, so to speak, and wasn't looking to create something to fulfill selfishly something he needed. That's, that's, not, that's nonsensical when we talk about the Creator. When we talk about why did the Creator create the world, we're only talking about purpose in terms of what is the purpose of the world. And the purpose of the world is creation for the love of it. And love is its own purpose. And in already we're beginning to understand, so what is this world about? It's about love. And love is its own purpose. If you love somebody because you're lacking something, or you're looking to accomplish something, or you're looking for some future benefit, that's not love, that's business. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with business, but it's just not love. Love has no reason. I love you because I love you. And what am I looking to get out of it? Nothing. Love is not uh, a means to an end. Love an end is an end to itself. Uh, one evening I was sitting with my wife and I turned to her and I said, Sarah, why do you love me? She said, my name's Hannah. I'm just joking. And uh, I said, okay, well, why do you love me? And she said, I don't have a reason. And I was really taken aback by that. You don't have a reason? You can't find one reason to love me? She said, not only do I have no reason to love you, you, you wouldn't want me to have a reason to love you. And I said, I, I think I would. <laughs> I think I would. I mean, what about my sense of humor? She said, oh, no, that's definitely not a good reason. I said, well, come on. She says, you see, if I had a reason to love you, then it would be the reason I love and not you. And what would happen if that reason were no longer valid? What would happen to my love? I love you for no reason. I even love you when you give me reasons not to, and I, I do just to test her. Creation was for no reason, but it was for a purpose. The purpose of love. God created the world as an act of love, a spontaneous act of love, looking for nothing out of it for himself. It's a spontaneous act of love. So what is this world? You might call it a love machine. It's a place for love. It's a context to provide love. So the meaning of purpose is what is being provided here? What is it all about? The general purpose of the world is the world was created from love, for the sake of love, no reason, but for a purpose. The purpose you've heard of, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the purpose of this world, to provide a context, to provide the context for loving your neighbor as yourself. But there's a difference between purpose and meaning. And without meaning, it's not enough. You need both purpose and meaning. So let's talk about what's the meaning of meaning, and that's next. the meaning of meaning and how, how to make your life meaningful. The meaning of meaning is like a word. What gives a word meaning? Now, you know, a word in a dictionary has meaning, but quite frankly, if I were a word and I had self-awareness, I wouldn't want to be hanging out in the dictionary because I want to be part of a sentence. I want to be part of a, a, a paragraph. I want to be part of a chapter, a book, a series. And so the meaning of meaning is that I'm part of some bigger story. Uh, you know, imagine the, wor the, the sentence, Joe sneezed the ball. Uh, which one of these words doesn't really have much meaning? It could be ball. 
uh, could be sneeze, or maybe it's Joe who's got a real problem. But, but the meaning of meaning is when you're part of a greater story, a, a greater context. And that's the same thing when we're looking for purpose and meaning. In this case, we're looking for meaning, is we want to be part of a story. And if you're a word, you don't want to be part of some trashy novel. You want to be part of a bestseller, an epic, a, 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 a story that really is a good story, a, a powerful, meaningful, important story. And so too, we as human beings, the meaning of life is when I'm part of a story and I want to be part of a great story. I want to be part of the story of creation. As I mentioned earlier on, what is the story of creation? The story of creation is the creator created for the sake of love, from love, for the sake of love. And creation is a, is an, is, is a story of endless, of endless love. That's what the story is. So the meaning of meaning is that I'm providing a service as part of a story. That's how purpose and meaning, you know, you could have a purposeful life, but it might not be a meaningful life. Let me give you an example. Let's go back to the car, Carl Benz. You have a, a car and it's providing its service, it's living its purpose, which is to provide transportation. But how meaningful is that? What if it's providing transportation for some getaway from some crime scene? Uh, if I were a car, I wouldn't want to be part of that story. And that's not really a very meaningful place to be. So you could have purpose whereby you're providing your service, but you might not have meaning because it's not really part of a story. You could be a car and you're zooming around and racing around, not going anywhere, so you are moving, but you're not meaningful. Or let's say, you know, you're a light bulb and you're giving off light, but you're, uh, and, and you're, so you're living your purpose. You, you give off light, but it might not be meaningful because you might be used by, as a flashlight for some some thief robbing a bank. You, you don't want to be part of that story. And so purpose is the service that I provide. Meaning is the story that I'm part of, that I'm serving to provide what I uniquely do and to be part of the service. For instance, let's talk about my purpose. I, certainly my purpose is in terms of career. My purpose is to teach. I hope you I think that's my purpose also. Uh, but, but, and I could be teaching, I could be teaching anything, but how meaningful is it? Because it depends. I mean, I don't want to be teaching uh, and helping people hurt other people I, I, or, or hide from themselves or whatever. I want to be teaching in order to help people be part of a meaningful life that they're also part of a story. So your purpose is the service you provide. Your meaning is the story, the context that you are providing that service in. So we want a meaningful life and a purposeful life. So purpose is to do your thing. Meaning is to do your thing in a greater story, but a valuable story, a great story. And in this case, we want to live our purpose as members of and contributors to the story of creation, the story of endless love. A number of years ago, a, a student came into my office and he shared with me that his father was the most moral man he'd ever met in his life. And he doesn't believe that if he had Jewish wisdom in his life, he had the Torah wisdom in his life, he would have been any more moral. Well, so I asked him, do you think your father would have been holier? And he was taken aback by that question. I mean, well, you know, he said, like, what, is, you know, what does that mean? I said, that's a mistake people make. People think that the wisdom is Torah and the guidance of Torah is to be a good person. And, uh, and, and, and we all should be a good person, but the truth is to really benefit from the wisdom of Torah and the guidance of Torah. Uh, it, its purpose is to help you become a, a holy person. Now what's the difference between a good person and a holy person? Uh, now of course you can't be a holy person without being a good person. But you could be a good person, but you're still not holy. And, uh, and most people don't even realize this, but whenever we do a commandment in Torah life, uh, we say, blessed are you who makes us holy through your commandments. It doesn't say who makes us into good people. It makes us into holy people. So what's the difference between a holy person and a good person? So let's go to the car example. 
um, you know, a, a holy person uh, is a person that's whole. A holy car would be a car that's whole. It does its thing. What is its thing? Its thing is to provide transportation. That's what holy means. You know, it's one of the few words that actually was translating from Hebrew to English, which actually is pretty good. Uh, a lot of the Hebrew words lose in the translation, but holy is a good word for the word kadosh, asher kidishanu. It's just spelled wrong. It should be spelled W-H-O-L-L-Y. The goal is to be wholly you, to be completely, totally you. And who are you? You are your why. You are your purpose. You don't have a purpose. You are your purpose. And so let's go back to the car. You could have a good car, but it might not be holy. A good car is, uh, provides uh, good things. You know, let's say it's raining and the car uh, invites people to sit in there and protect it from the rain. Well, that's good. That's really good. It's not holy because that's not what the purpose of the car is. The purpose of the car is to provide transportation. So that's very, very good. You could have a light bulb. What's its purpose? Its purpose is to give off light and illuminate the room. Now, the truth is that the light also provides heat. And it could be that someone might warm up their cold hands over, over the light bulb, and that's good. But that's not holy. Because holy is when you are completely devoted in complete service of your purpose. Now, we all want to be doing good things, but we also want to be holy. You are your why. Let's go back to Carl Benz, who invented the car. Carl had a goodwill. I want to provide transportation. And I'm sure he wanted to provide transportation for good things. I don't think he invented the car to help people pull off robberies. And so the car is actually the embodiment of the goodwill of Carl Benz. Let's take Thomas Edison. He wants to invent the light bulb. His intention is to create and give a purpose. His purpose was to give light. And I'm sure he wanted to give light for good things, not for light to enable bad things. So again, the essence of the light bulb is the goodwill of Thomas Edison. That's what you and I are. We are the embodiment of goodwill. And our purpose is to live that goodwill, to be ourselves. You know, it's a kind of interesting thing when people say, I don't know what I want. Like, I try to figure out what I want. It's very strange when you just choose, just choose what you want. No, somehow we deep inside sense that, that there's already a will inside. I'm just trying to figure out what I want. And the truth is choice is to want what you in your deepest depth want. If you were a car, and you say, well, I don't know what I want. You want to provide transportation for good events, for good reasons, for, for good opportunities. And your choice is to choose to want what you want because what you want in your deepest depths is who you are. And so that is your purpose. That's who you are, to live the total you, the complete you, to live your purpose, to be your purpose, and to be your purpose within the context of a great story, and that's the story of creation. The story, again, of endless love. I mentioned earlier on that I began my journey in the study of Kabbalah when I was in my teens, when I was uh, in my late 17. And, uh, so I'm gonna now fast forward from that story I shared with you a number of years later. My friend and I were walking in an, an area called Geula, which is an Orthodox area in Jerusalem. And my friend turns to me and he says, you know, today is the beginning of the new month, the, what's called Rosh Chodesh in Hebrew. And, uh, and you know, we're on the street of the great Kabbalist, the Lula Varebi. Um, and I said, well, why are you bringing this up? He said, because, uh, since it's Rosh Chodesh, he might be hosting a tish. Now, a tish is Yiddish for a table. And what happens is these great Hasidic masters have their students gather around and they share words of Torah and they eat and they sing and they have a gathering. So uh, he said, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's hosting a tish. I said, well, that's very nice, but why would we go there? He says, you don't understand. He's a Kabbalist. He can look right through you. He can see your soul. I said, you know what? I definitely don't want to meet him. <laughs> I don't want to meet anybody who looks through my soul. 
He said, oh, come on, don't be a chicken. Let's go inside. Let's see what's going on. So we went in there, and in fact, the rabbi was hosting a tish. There were hundreds of people in the hallway, in, the, in, this, in this hall. We walked in through the door, and this Kabbalist suddenly said, ha! And he starts staring in our direction. Well, we don't know. We kind of move over to the side. And he's still, still, still he's staring in our direction. And I'm starting to get this nervous feeling. And very quickly, everybody in the room realized that somebody caught the attention of the rabbi and the Rebbe. And so they're also looking. Who's the Rebbe looking at? Who's the Rebbe looking at? And uh, well, my friend and I at the back of the room, we're looking at the wall. Well, who, who's the Rebbe looking at? And then the Rebbe started the point. And everyone was saying, well, who's, who's the Rebbe pointing at? Who's the Rebbe pointing at? And before I know it, the entire room was pointing at my friend and I, and the rabbi wants to see us, you know, the one that looks through your soul. Well, I'm not scared, because most of my friends are taller than me. So I put my friend in front of me, and we start working, walking towards the rebbe. And two of the students of the rebbe grabbed my friend from both sides and pushed him through the crowd, and the rebbe started talking to him, and I was thankful that he wasn't going to talk to me. But I was, uh, uh, I was a little bit too hopeful there because the rabbi started to yell in Yiddish, and I understand Yiddish. Where's the other one? I want the other one. Before I knew it, these two big guys grabbed me and started pushing me through the crowd, and there I am standing in front of this Kabbalist who looks through my soul. And the uh, Kabbalist asked me some uh, very odd questions, which I'm not going to go into right now. But after I finally uh, responded in a satisfactory way to his questions, the rabbi stood up and he held an apple by its stem. So, okay, I'm going to get something out of this meeting, okay. So I reached for the apple. And as I'm reaching for the apple, the whole room screams, no! The rabbi looks at me, smiles, he dangles the apple in front of me again. So, okay, I don't know, I, I, I reach to take the apple. And the whole room screams, no! And then I look around, I see people are going like this with their hand. And then I realize that uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You don't go like this, you go like this. And so when I cupped my hand underneath the apple and the rabbi dropped the apple in my hand, uh, two of his, uh, his students grabbed me in a sweet way and pulled me out and you, you've had enough time with this great holy man. Okay, I had an apple. Well, the rabbi did a little singing and talking. Suddenly this man, he's in his mid-80s. He gets up. And he charges across the room and everybody parts like the splitting of the sea and he goes to the door of the hall and he puts his hand on the mezuzah and he starts to pray. Then he turns around and he darts back into the room, running into the room and he goes to the holy ark and he puts his hands on the ark where the Torah is stored and he starts to pray. I, nobody knows which way the rabbi goes. It looks some, some kind of Kabbalistic you know, game of chicken. I don't know what's going on. Rabbi turned around and he charges into the middle of the crowd. He stops in the dime, turns around, looks me in the face, and he says, pointing to me, what are you studying? The whole place goes quiet. What are you studying? Hey, I was really in my early, early 20s. And I wasn't about to announce in front of everybody what I was studying, so I said, which was true, I'm studying Talmud. I said, I'm, I'm studying Talmud. Rabbi looked at me and said, well, which, which book of the Talmud? Well, I said, Shabbat, and he looked at me with a smile and he started to laugh, <laughs> and he ran away. And I don't know what that was about, and people started shaking my hand, and I was shaking like a leaf, and I walked out of there, and my friend said, what was that all about? Why, why did he pick you out of the crowd? Why did, he, why did he give you the apple in that weird way? Why, why did he ask you, what are you studying? But you see, what that rabbi did see through my soul, I was studying Kabbalah. And most people think that Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism, but the word Kabbalah comes from the word lekabel, which means to receive. In order to find and live the purpose of your life, I want to share with you something called the law of reception. Because the law of reception is really the essence of the secrets of Torah life. Which, as you might have heard of a book called The Secret, which was about the law of attraction, well, I want to give you the secret of secrets. It's called the law of reception. And that's what we're about. You know, we were talking in metaphor, if you were a car, you are the embodiment of the goodwill for transportation. Be who you are, live your purpose, be part of a bigger story and provide and do good. If you were a light bulb, then you're in the embodiment of the will of 
the goodwill for giving life, providing life. You want to have a meaningful life. You want to be part of a story, a good story, a loving story. Well, so metaphorically, actually, what kind of, what are we? We are radios, metaphorically. That would be our service. What is a radio? A radio, uh, in and of itself, doesn't have any power. Uh, a radio's job is to plug in, turn on, and tune in, and receive and transmit. It's called a receiver and tr transmitter of music. You know, in this room right there, the, right now, there's music, but nobody hears the music because we're not tuned into it. And, uh, but it's here. It's here. The Kabbalah teaches that the music of life is love. The story of creation is love. And that's what we're here to do. And I don't think anybody here wouldn't want to be part of a world that's being loved and is loving. But what do you need to do to bring that into the world? Because it's already there. It's already there. Creation is an act of love for the sake of love. It's a story of love. We are radios. Now imagine you got these two radios talking to each other. And one radio says to the other one, I'm going crazy. I'm hearing... I'm constantly hearing noise. It's incredibly annoying noise. Well, the other radio says, I don't know what you're talking about. I hear, uh, I hear beautiful music. Well, what's your, what, what, what's your, I don't get it. He said, you hear music. I don't hear any music. My life is filled with noise. He said, wait a second. I don't think you're tuned in. The guy said, what are you talking about? Tuned into what? He says, we're radios. And our job is to tune into the music. And if you're not tuned into the music, then you're gonna hear noise. You're just gonna hear noise. That's the law of reception. In terms of living our purpose, or specifically living on purpose, we're like radios. And there is a song playing, there's a story being told, and that story is a story of love. Our job is to receive that and transmit that to all of us. So we want to learn how to, and every detail of Torah life is there to help us tune into the story or the song of bringing more love, compassion, kindness, peace into the world.